All right. Uh, so I'm Martha Zink. I'm from Salient Consulting, um, and I'm going to talk about some FileMaker reporting techniques. Um, just a warning, I did this presentation earlier in 15 minutes, the short version of it. So I'm going to try my best to slow down, uh, but I'm, I might refresh back to speed talking. So mm -hmm. feel free to tell me to calm down a little bit. All right, so I'm a technical project lead at Salient. Um, I've been doing development for about 15 years. Um, I've spent 12 years doing training and mentoring. So even now, uh, we get a lot of clients that just need help doing their own development. And so we can help in trying to figure out uh, whatever your problem is. Instead of it being a more traditional training program, um, if you just have a report you can't figure out or you're trying to get some integration to happen, uh, we can just play your, your advisor and that kind of thing. Um, and I've been at Salient for about eight years now. Um, I'm out of Houston, Texas, and um, we started the Houston office about two years ago. Um, so that was my baby. Um, and so uh, that's where I'm at. This year, I became the CEO of Pause on Air. Has anyone been to Pause before? Yeah. Any one person has been. Um, Pause on Air is a file maker on conference. Um, it's been running for about 10 years now uh, and it's changing to my hands. Uh, I helped plan one in New Orleans. Um, I'd highly recommend it. It's a really uh, unique experience. It's really all about community building and spending you know, a lot of time just nerding out on FileMaker and what we love. Um, and I'm a mom of two. Those are my little kids. They're um, almost three and five. And uh, I, some days I don't know what's harder if development or project managing children is harder, but they're both jobs I take, so. So today I wanna to focus on uh, different reporting techniques. And so it's kind of the, the evolution starts with just talking really simply about what subsummary reports are and just doing some quick examples there. That's kind of the most common, most longstanding way we've been doing reporting in FileMaker. And then just go through some other techniques that, that I've found useful um, and put all of these into actual practice. Oops, they're just screen. <clears throat> Oh, there you go. Share your screen. Thank you. Is that better? Thank you. Sorry about that. Well, not okay. So let's see. Make sure it's my. They, they missed the pictures of the kids. Okay, so there's the pictures of the kids because those are important. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, so these are the the, the, the five different things that we're going to talk about here. Um, the format here is we're going to I'm going to have just a quick slide with some bullets on what each. Uh, thing is, and then I, I've got some screenshots, but I'll just jump over to FileMaker and actually show them in practice. Um, and then I'll talk about some pros and cons. In my mind, when it comes to reporting, uh, there is no, all of these have their value and all of them are, there's a reason to use all of these. It just depends on complexity and performance issues and speed and things like that. Um, so hopefully you don't take away that any one of these is worse than the other. They're just different. They just all have a different, uh, different need. So subsummary reports, uh, has everyone created a subsummary report in here before? It's like the you know summary fields, you add some, some, some parts to your layout. Uh, most important thing is you sort your layout, right? Um, <laughs> that's right, we didn't make a drinking game out of subsummary, so <laughs> cheers to everyone. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I remember learning this trick and, and thinking it was so cool that if you, you know, normally when you create your report, your subsummary report, you get it. <laughs> you get it with the body. You get the details, right? So you get your 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 um, your grouped field, and then you get all that stuff below it. Uh, but then if you delete the body of that layout, then you get a more summarized report. And that was always pretty pretty cool to see that happen. Um, so I've got screenshots, but let me just jump over to FileMaker real quick. So this one again is pretty basic. Um, yeah, yes. Let me just open this one it's up. It's not my first radio air. Come on. Mm -hmm. I only forgot to do that once. Well, I'll never forget. <laughs> so again, pretty simple sub-summary report, right? This is grouped by a certain uh, description of how those tasks are from an uh, upcoming perspective. So these are the past due ones. These are the today, next seven days, and so on. Um, and if uh, we can add multiple subsummaries. So if we add the full name, for example, and sort by that, then we're going to get two subsummaries, right? Past due and Sabrina, past due and Spencer, right? So again, this is a pretty traditional way of doing reporting in FileMaker. Um, nothing too crazy there. And then this is the one where it's summarized uh, by the category. 
but we just removed the body so it you only see those summary sections. So those are the screens you just saw. Um, the pros are, the first one is that it's native to FileMaker, right? It doesn't take any fancy tricks to get them to work. Uh, they're very much part of the, the platform. Um, and it's it's simple in that it doesn't need a lot of complexity to it. There's just layouts, the subsummary fields, you know, one or more if you need them, and then you're just sorting a certain way. The biggest cons are it's not flexible, right? What, if you've ever tried using these before for a bigger solution, you create one and then your client asks you or, or your boss or whoever asks you for another report and now you either have to try to make that one work or you create a second layout to create a new one, but it's not that flexible and not very reusable. Uh, and if anyone deals with large found sets, uh, I'm sure we've all seen the summarizing dialogue that comes up or the sorting one on top of that. Uh, and then now your users are waiting for a while to get a report of, you know, thousands of records potentially, which which can be a bummer from a user's perspective. So sub summaries are great; they work. It's fast to implement, but but again, not not very flexible. So next, we come up with execute SQL, and so here is where things got a little bit more interesting, right? Now we had to bring in a new technology, right? So now we have um, a select statements as something that we can do in FileMaker. And this is just a simple example of what a select statement looks like. Um, has everyone written these in the room? Has everyone used these? Does it feel pretty comfortable to, to write them out? Or is it still a little bit foreign? Basic ones. The basic ones, yeah. Well, I, was, I mentioned this to someone in the earlier presentation. Um, what I love about, the, about Execute SQL is that you can start really basic and build it up. So if you just do, if you were to ignore the where up here, and I just said select patient name and patient age from patient, I would get a result back, right? If that all matched my um, my tables and fields. And then as you see the results there, you can say, okay, now let me add some complexity on top. And you would say where this and that, and you can keep adding more and more until you get the actual found set that you want. Um, so I, again, I like that you can you can learn it from a, a very simplistic way, and then you can grow and, and learn all about joins and some group buys and order buys and things like that. So I'm going to jump over to a file here. I thought I'd opened all these. One second. I demoed this at DevCon a couple of years ago, um, and so I built just a little calculation thing here that just that lets you write a, a select statement, and then it'll it'll automatically calculate it for you. So over here you'll have, um, I've got like an expense table and that's what that's based off of right there. So you'll see, uh, as long as my field names match up okay, I'm, you know, here luckily I'm using a bunch of fields that are, that are FileMaker safe. Um, and my big tagline for that DevCon was practice safe SQL. So if there's a lot of words that aren't allowed. You've got to be careful to make sure that you use the right ones. Um, and I'll, in another example, I'll show you how to kind of protect everything so that you don't even, you know, in older solutions, we. We did things a little differently then, you know, and we might have done underscores at the beginning and things like that. We might still be doing it. Um, and there are ways to, to prevent that from being an issue with, with Execute SQL. So what I was saying earlier with building it up is that you can start with something like this. Uh, that. And you can get an actual result, right? There's no where, so this is like saying show all records in FileMaker instead of doing a find and saying, show me two fields. Um, and then that's where you can add more complexity and you can say uh, where category equals gift. And then that should give me just those results, right? And not super useful data since I'm not really showing any uh, variability there, but there's, I'm just pulling data all down based on whatever my find is, whatever my, my uh, where clause says. Good so far? Yeah. So again, some, just a couple of examples. Some of the cool things about Execute SQL is that you can uh, sort and you can group on the fly and you can create relationships on the fly. Uh, that's a big deal because in, in traditional FileMaker, you've got to create TOs and connect a bunch of things if you want to be able to see related data. Um, Execute SQL doesn't have, isn't looking at context. So I can say, start here and then group, you know, start at expenses and group it to clients on the fly. Even if my TOs, even if my relationships graph doesn't have that relationship, doesn't matter, we can do it on the fly with Execute SQL. 
so here's one that's a little bit more more complex uh, because I wanted to create a you know a relationship between two tables I now have to do a join and I tell you and it says what it's joined by so now we're joining the client table the ID of the client to the ID underscore client in the expense table and then in this one I'm grouping up the data so I'm actually grouping by the year the category and the client name so this information is a sum it would be like the equivalent of a sub summary report um, without the body So pros, um, it's got built-in grouping and sorting. That's nice, right? And it's it's it can be really really fast. Uh, you can create relationships on the fly, and it's not based on your current context, which means that I can be on a resource layout, I can be on a main menu, I can be anywhere, and I can look at any of the data from from a calculation. I don't have to be on a layout, unlike a sub summary report. The cons is it's just a blob of text. You still have to do something with it. So you still have to place it somewhere or parse it out or, or uh, work with it somehow. Um, again, it doesn't always like the FileMaker naming convention. So you have to be a little bit delicate to make sure that you're going to have it formatted the right way. Um, and a con, just like it's a pro, is that it's not based on the current context. So sometimes you do want it to be based on the found set and you lose that ability when you, uh, when you use execute SQL. All right, who's used virtual lists before? Yeah. All right, so this is my happy place. When I presented this, I got really excited, uh, but it's pretty easy for me to nerd out on FileMaker, so mm -hmm. not too shocking. Um, the virtual list, wh when I first learned this, it, it just felt like magic. Um, I actually first saw this, uh, he was the one who started it. Johnson Allard did a really good job from seed code of promoting uh, this virtual list technique he used a lot of in his solution at the time. and it, it really does just feel like magic because all of a sudden you can take a blob of text and you can do something with it. You can show it as if it were real data in FileMaker. So at a, at a very basic level, what it is, is it's a table where the data is stored in local memory. So it's not like you're looking at a table and fields traditionally. You're using a blob of text somewhere and you're parsing it out to show it in what looks like a normal FileMaker table. Um, so that table that you create, what well, really doesn't have any specific context, you feed it some data. So let me open up the virtual list file. So this is a virtual list table right here. Um, and I've created the most basic version of it. So it has two fields in it. The first field is, I'm calling it the row field. And so that just has an auto enter serial number from one to however many records I have. So probably one to a thousand, I'll give or take. And then there is a field that I call all values. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a blob of text into a global field. And that global field is going to be ZG data. And then the, the records that I created in this virtual list table, it's going to go grab a row of data from that blob of text. So if I open up a separate window here, there's that DG data field. So if I put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, if I go over here and refresh this window, you'll see that row one grabs the first value, row two grabs the second value and the three and so on and so forth. Questions about that so far? What's nice about this is that you have a lot of flexibility because you can put as much text in, you, again, I can do something like execute SQL to get a blob of text, and then I can manipulate it and then show it in FileMaker however I want. It's pretty common in this for this kind of thing to have multiple, starting with especially something like execute SQL, you can have things that are you know, pipe delimited or tab delimited or whatever you, know, whatever you wanna use, um, but you can show multiple things. So if I do something like that, I'm gonna go refresh this real quick. So in concept there, I'm, I'm saying maybe that, you know, if this was a, a grading scale, we had four students that received A's, I can put everything in one box, but then I can have multiple fields to parse that out. I'll make a quick note here that my that make sure that if you do something like this where you have all values, it has to be on stored because it's local. Uh, and you'll learn this lesson very quickly because we all do it, which is you forget to make it unstored and then it won't update. And then you go in, you drink a little bit because I said it's a summary and then you know you, it'll work finally. So I can go in here and say, um, the maybe the grade is the first field I want. 
and so you see i have my i've got my all values there right so i can say let all values uh, sorry let uh vals equal all values and i can maybe substitute that and change the i'm going to change the pipe to a return so then i'll get a return four or i'll get b return two and then I can say get value from val grab value one, right? Because that would be the A, right? If it's at A return four and I say get value one, I would get the very first thing. We'll make that text. Don't forget a closing parentheses. And then I'm going to duplicate that and I'm going to change this to uh, quantity. And again, very similar logic here, but instead of getting the first value, now I want the second value to give me that quantity field. And so if I add those fields to the layout now, you'll see that I have my data parsed out nicely, right? So again, this is all completely based off of, uh, it's all based off of this field right here. So as I use execute SQL or I use a looping script or I use JSON or whatever it is, whatever my technique is, I can grab whatever I want and then show it. What I like about this, probably more than anything is that in a script you have the freedom to collect the data however you want right so let's just think of a basic looping script right it doesn't have to be fancy to collect this data um, I could have a looping script that goes to the orders table and does something and then it goes to the line items table and does something else and then it goes to the client table and does something else and then I can show one big cool report all at once right because again there's no context here right it's however I want it to be formatted so that gives you a lot of flexibility So a couple, let's see, that was the virtual list. For the execute SQL, I'm going to go back to this file for a second. Um, especially before JSON came into the picture the way it has, execute SQL and value list and uh, virtual list, they were meant, they were totally meant to live together. They're really strong together. And it's again, it's that collection of data and then showing the data, right? They're just two different tools. And so here we've got a list of expenses. I have a thousand expenses. And so I've got a couple of scripts in this file that will create reports for me. And so if you look at this script, the only thing that's really important is this setting a global field, or sorry, a global variable called report data. And it's using execute SQL to basically set, to collect some data. And so if I run that, we end up with a, a pretty basic report here. Let me go back to this one. So it's, again, if I go into layout mode, you'll see that these fields are completely generic and it's just off of this virtual list table. It doesn't have any context or anything related to, to expenses. I'm just uh, collecting a blob of text and then parsing it out. This one, so that's, so you'll see that these will actually match up line by line, right? So that first record is gonna be 30,000 and so on. What's super cool about this is that you can actually sort these records and do whatever you want with it. FileMaker will still treat it like it were like it's real data. So I can go in here and sort these um, by dollar amount. I can do a find, so I can say, uh, show me anything where Mary is the, the staff member. So I think that's pretty pretty cool stuff there. And because FileMaker does see it as real data, you can use it with charting. You can use it in a lot of other ways. You can use scripts with it. You can do all kinds of things. So you get a lot of flexibility there. Hello. It sounds like everyone's pretty familiar with Execute SQL, so I won't harp on it for much longer, but I do want to point out that, uh, back to my practice safe SQL comment, um, there's a lot of caution that you want to have because it will break, right? If you use underscores at the beginning, if you use um, certain words that aren't allowed. Um, so you'll see I have some custom functions here. Uh, this custom function will end up wrapping the table occurrence name and the field name in quotes with a period in between, and that makes it really safe so that it, it can actually uh, calculate that out. And GTN is get the table name. So we're using fields here. And the nice thing about this is if a field name changes, it's not going to break, right? So if sales rep becomes salesperson, that's okay because it's treated here as, a calcu as, a, as an actual field, it'll change. Now, um, this is another, again, I just wanted to show a couple of different ways to do it. This is another way that I tend to do it, which is, uh, this is all about being it, uh, the, the execute SQL being legible. And so I really want something very simple in this case, right? Select something from somewhere, group by 
whatever, or where, or join, or whatever the extra pieces are. Um, and so for legibility, I have them set up as, as uh, variables at the top. And so this to me was a little bit easier to read uh, because I see every, when, if there, I have an error, I can just look at the top at the field section and make sure everything's right and so on. So when I was preparing for DEF CON, I had lunch and Bob Bowers, our CEO was sitting next to me and he's like, you don't do it the way I do it. And I said, I, I, apparently I don't. And so uh, I didn't have very long before my presentation to implement it, but I felt like I had to because his approach is actually pretty good. And that is um, you write it out something like this. So you write it out in what's semi-legible, right? So I can read that as, I as if I'd written it in the you know, unsafe way. So select sales rep category and the sum of the amount from expense and so on. But then you just replace a bunch of stuff. So what's, what makes this super cool is that it's pretty common that if you're gonna do something like a group by, that you're going to already reference an existing field that you've referenced once, ab once above. And so by doing it this way, that substitute is going to substitute it in both places, right? So I'm substituting dash sales rep dash with, with this safe version of the sales rep field. Does that make sense? So as much as I wanted to be right it with it before Bob gave me the example, I thought his was pretty great, so I included it. So all three of those are gonna create the exact same report. Um, the other cool thing about execute SQL and uh, virtual list is that you can do things like cross tabs. So let me go to this layout. So I can look at data and I can just break it apart into different ways, right? So as a as a FileMaker developer, I would like no one, I would like for everyone to stop asking me for anything that's cross tab because FileMaker doesn't do cross tab very easily, right? Uh, but I don't get to win that argument because if clients need a cross tab report, that's what they're going to get. I'm sure we've all felt that pain, right? Uh, so here you can actually do that. So I can have multiple variables. So I've got uh, report data here, which is similar to what we were looking at before. And then I can also have a, a columns uh, global variable and that can tell me what, what's at the top and then what's down the side. And then sky's the limit really with execute SQL because it's just a, I mean, execute SQL, the actual select statement is, is in concept just text that you format. And so you can use some placeholders to basically create a, create a select statement on the fly. So if I wanted to see expenses by quarter for a category for that date range, I can do that and that report can change without me ever changing the layout because it's a virtual list. It has no context, right? So then I can go in here and say, no, I wanna see it by, oh, you know what? Let me just see everything, not just by category. I wanna see it grouped by a bunch of stuff. And so when I do that, you'll see it's grouped by category and then the data is grouped like by client. So this is all one body of text, right? It's one found set of records. But now instead of seeing it in one format, we're seeing it broken down in four different groups. I think it's pretty cool, right? Because this is what people are asking for is show me all the data at once. In concept, give me a dashboard of the information I care about. So that can be a really great way to get, get your clients the reports you want. The spacing is totally handled in that, yeah. I'm trying to think, I think I added a bunch of extra spaces in there after the categories, but let me check. Yeah, I'd have to look to be honest. Um, I'm not sure how I did how I did that one because I remember I, I spent some time trying to make it more obvious. Uh, let's just see real quick. Thanks. What data? Some of these scripts get a little crazy, so. I've got a trailing grant summary, which I know is uh, coming up at the end there. Um, but I do think I have something with the row doing some funky stuff to, to pull it apart. So I'll have to dig a little deeper to see. But uh, but yeah, I wanted the spacing to be a little bit obvious. So it wasn't didn't look like a big jumbled mess of too much data. And then I actually built I had a, a client and they were using um, they were using reporting in a different way and, and they were using it as notifications and I actually really liked this as a feature, which is uh, they imagine having some type of icon in the corner and when you click on it, it tells you a really summarized version of something. And so here it's telling me how many expenses haven't been paid, 
uh, things that are $500 more in the last 30 days, and then clients with high expenses. And so what that does is it runs a script that runs a bunch of subscripts, because really I'm doing three different unique searches to find that information. Uh, so here it's running these three scripts, and these three scripts don't ever leave this layout. It's all execute SQL based. So again, because I don't have any loss in context, I don't care about where I'm standing, I can go ahead and, and run those three scripts, those three subscripts, and get the data that I want. Uh, for their specific scenario, they're hosted on a server, so they could run that on perform script on server, right? Make the server do the hard work, then bring back that data efficiently so that we can show it. And because this is a virtual list, I can do anything with it. So when I click on one of these, it can go and take me to the 22 records that it found there. Um, they use this in practice right now, and I think it's, it's actually really exciting because uh, it lets you get to the right, the right information. Um, and again, you're picking what that little, what, the, what those uh, warnings or those notifications are, right? You're giving yourself, all, you're giving your client the information that they need when they need it by performing all these execute SQLs or finds uh, to get the right information. Questions or thoughts on virtual lists and execute SQL? All right. The part that was, you know, sure. There was a relationship involved here, right? For which one? For the virtual list? No. There doesn't have to be. Oh. Yeah, so a virtual list by its, can, can live by itself. And so, yeah, in this case, nothing's connected. Oh. Um, in the execute SQL portion of it, you can do joins to, to get the data grouped up the way you want. But generally speaking, yeah, they can be, they, it doesn't have to touch anything. Yep, absolutely. And sometimes and I've had to play with that a little bit. Like, is it faster to create the relationship versus do I do the join and execute SQL? I haven't found a good I, I it always seems like a debate in my mind. So I'm always trying to figure out which one I like better for that that solution, but great point. So you use it for data entry, so you can actually use like a master list from the virtual table and then actually break through a relationship connection. Oh, nice! I like that. Yeah. So using so creating a relationship to create related data through a through the relationship. I like that. That's nice. All right. So virtual list table based, but again, no context. You're kind of faking a context just to have the file maker structure the tables and the fields, uh, and then you can do some cross tab stuff. So the pros, it's context neutral, right? So I can do a bunch of calculations on the fly and then I can pull that information in. Um, and then it works really well with summary fields. So because FileMaker treats it as a, treats it as a regular table, I can use sub, I can use sub summary reports with a virtual list if I want to. So it's a really great way to do things. Now keep in mind the virtual list is just a display mechanism and that's really important to realize. You're basically creating a structure so that you can give it data to show. So it's not going to work great by itself. You've got to find a way to feed it data, whether that's execute SQL or a script, uh, a looping script, anything like that. And it does impact your schema. Now you have to create a new table and fields. So you know sometimes that just feels like it might ease the waters a little, a little bit, but, but oftentimes it's worth it. So the match made in heaven is you add these two together, right? So you, you put the two together, and then you can get some really cool reports. Um, I talked about that uh, GTFN for get table and field name, that custom function. This is what that ends up looking like if you were to look at just the, the SQL portion or the select statement portion. So you'll see it puts everything in quotes. That means that if uh, expense, instead of being that, if that wasn't the table name, if it was something that was, uh, was a word that execute SQL doesn't allow, it would be okay because it's in quotes. It would actually read it just fine. And same thing if the sales rep had an underscore before it, that execute SQL doesn't like that, but as long as it's in quotes, it'll it'll ignore it and it'll be fine. All right, enter JSON. So when execute SQL came out, I was a little hesitant. Now I've got to learn a new thing. And then JSON came out, and then I was super hesitant because I had just learned execute SQL, and now you want me to learn another thing. Um, and for anyone who comes out from outside of the FileMaker world, a lot of people already know JSON. And that wasn't me. I started in FileMaker, so you know I, I just know all the FileMaker things. Um, but JSON is a really well-known data format. It gets used by a lot of APIs and web services. So there's a lot of value in getting to know about it. And FileMaker started making it easier to set and parse out the JSON, which has been super helpful. 
So this is an example of what JSON will look like. Now, if you think of XCPSQL, I like to think of it as doing a find in FileMaker, right? It's a, it's a way to find the right data that you want. And in that case, and for execute SQL, it makes one big blob of it. JSON doesn't collect data so much as it organizes it for you. So you have to have a mechanism to collect that information. Um, the most common way to do it that I can think of is usually to do a loop. So you do a looping script, you go through a bunch of records, so you can create your array. In the example I'm going to show you, uh, because I'm still fighting the JSON craze, I create fake JSON, and it works. So I'm, you know, we're getting there. We're slowly moving toward me accepting JSON here. Um, but there are ways to basically manipulate the data because I'm using the tools that I know. I know how to loop really well in a script. FileMaker came out with the while function, so I can manipulate that. Um, but the but but JSON here is great because it's organizing my data in a way that the computer loves it, right? I can pull a very specific piece of data from that JSON if I need to. This is an example of what setting the JSON can look like. So I can in one, it's it's very similar to the substitute function where you can put things in brackets to do multiples at once. And so if I'm looking at uh, the expense table, I can set a bunch of different pieces of that JSON all at once. I don't have to do, I don't have to call multiple script steps, for example, to do that or write multiple um, calculations. And you can tie JSON into virtual lists so that you can actually have a JSON array and then have the virtual list parse it out correctly. So this is a file, uh, this one. Uh, Bob Bowers presented this at DEF CON this year um, as as part of his training day. He did the advanced training, and so he he gave me this file to share. And so I'm going to switch to this layout right here. What we have is we have store data, we have region data, and we have order data. So we've got all these different chunks of information, right? And I've got a virtual list to show some of this information. And so what he's done is he's created a script that lets you combine data. So one thing that can be really challenging in execute SQL or even in anything that's a return to limited list is how do you get data from a bunch of different places and put them together correctly? So you might think if you've got people working at a store and you have orders at a store, how do you associate the two? And so because JSON is so clearly written and it's, so, it's, it's very programmatic, I can tell it to go set something in the array and it knows where to put it in the right place. So in this case, you'll see the, the very first thing he's doing is setting to execute, he's using execute SQL to get the right data. Then he's using the while function to basically go through that information and put it in the right spot. So what you end up with is some basic information about just the sales information, right? So we're just getting the count of the sales and then the total amounts. And then you can add some information about the store, and then you can end up adding some region information. So this virtual list, which doesn't look very virtual at all, but is, it lets you collect, this is collecting information from three different places, and it's all being accumulated in a single, uh, in a single JSON array. And so it's a little hard to see because it looks like this if you don't format it. So let me format it and I'll show you what it, how, how, it, how it actually uh, cleans up. All right, so I'm going to just run it here. So that was the, the most simple version of it. And you'll see that there's the store number and then there's some information about it. So again, it used execute SQL to collect that data and then it reorganized it into some JSON. And then I'm just gonna jump to stage three here, but you'll see that it, this more complex script started with that same array and then just added more, more uh, information to that, to that one JSON array. And so you'll see that we still have store one, but now it's added things like location and the uh, order count and uh, inactive count and so on. So you can get a pretty cool report like this. And then he did some filtering stuff here too. So if you wanted to filter by a region, you can get that information parsed out. So again, you can give your users some control over how they uh, manipulate the report. You don't have to just force them to, uh, to see everything at once. So 
So JSON is easy to read for a computer. Uh, and so if you look at it, if you look at a, a chunk of JSON, you'll be able to, to read it as if it were a paragraph, because that's really how it's written out. Um, and so with the FileMaker functions that come with it, you can set values, you can uh, you can set the JSON, you can get from the JSON, and those, those functions are really useful. The cons, it's just like a like execute SQL. At the end of the day, it's just a blob of text. So you still have to manipulate it and do something with it after. Um, JSON, because it's very programmatic and it's there's a very specific format to it, that means it's not very forgiving. And so if you don't format things properly, you're going to get errors. And uh, it does require looping through your data somehow, whether that's a virtual list, uh, I'm sorry, whether that's a, a looping script or execute SQL, you still have a f to find a way uh, or using the while function to basically parse that information out once you once you get it. So what are, you, what are you saying is the advantage of JSON over just using SQL? That's a great question. So the benefit, so the question is, what's the benefit of using uh, JSON over execute SQL? Um, JSON is more organized. And so, for example, in this report, the, one, the file that Bob gave me, uh, let me find it real quick. When I'm accumulating the data for this report, it would be really hard for me to, to deal with things like nulls. So like if I have a store and that store doesn't have any orders, in Execute SQL, you don't get any found set. Or you've got to do some really funky joins to get the data the way you want it. And now we're going to hit performance issues. As soon as you stop doing a, a regular join, there's usually a performance hit. And so with JSON, because it's just inserting text into very specific spots, it makes it really efficient. I don't have to actually care about the data or, or I don't have to be prepared for anything that is null. I just go and insert data as I go. So even though there's this extra overhead of having to go through that while loop to mm -hmm. gather from the SQL data and put it in JSON, yep. you're saying it's still, it's still worth it. Okay. Yeah. Time-wise, time -wise, absolutely. Oh. So the while function is impressively fast. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about while. Oh, I have, while. Yeah, and, the, and so it's cool. And you could loop through it too. But the nice thing is, is that once you have your data and you just put it in a variable, it's all local data at that point. So that you're just looping through that. Um, I, I say that and then I realize I'm gonna bite my tongue a little bit. JSON tends to be a performance hog when you have thousands of records. So like at 20, I, I know I've seen it at about 10 or 20,000. Mark, I, I know you're nodding there. Have you run into that issue too? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so it, once you start, because there's, again, it's so organized and it's so programmatic, the, the bigger it gets, the harder, the more searching it has to do within that JSON array to find the right place to put data, that it can start slowing down. So it's not always the, the most ideal situation. Um, but here I think we're dealing with thousands of records and it's fine, like, like 5,000 or less, so. It's also gonna preserve your hierarchy Absolutely. Yeah, JSON's really good about the hierarchy and having multiple values within something. So uh, it's a little bit of a game to be able to parse it out the right way. Uh, me and W3 schools are best friends for this kind of stuff. So I spend a lot of time there. All right, so JSON and virtual lists, again, it's a match made in heaven there. So I've already mentioned the while function. And so this came out recently and it's, I didn't get it at first. I didn't know why I was going to use it. I just thought it was like, oh, every other coding language has it, so we should throw it into FileMaker. I just didn't know what I was, how I was going to manipulate it because it just seems like a loop, a looping script would work just as well. Um, and in some cases, that's true, but it is pretty cool and it is really fast. Um, so let me. I had a client, and this one is a real. Uh, I imported it over, but it was for a real client. Um, they needed a report where they could see. A lot of information at once and so for them I formatted a little bit differently but they really just wanted to see a summary of everything and so you can use the while function to do quite a bit of that uh, and what's cool about this and, and works really well with this whole JSON approach my little fake JSON that I'll show you here in a second <clears throat> is that it can be context specific so I've got 46 there are 49 records here right so you'll see 46 are billable and three are not billable if I do anything uh, that was in 20, 2019, uh, that gives me, let's do, 
All right, so now I've got five time entries here. And now my data is based off of those five. So I can, because I'm looking at a found set and collecting some data, I can be very context specific and give just information that applies here specifically. So let me show you how that works. So I'm doing a little bit of fake JSON stuff here. I mentioned that earlier. So let me show you what I've got. There is a, there is a field in here. It's time entry JSON and it looks like this. So for each row in the database, for each record that I'm looking at, it's created its own little its own little mini array about it for the JSON. Then I created a list of fields. So I've got a, a summary field, which is the list of that JSON. Which if you try to actually treat that as JSON, it's going to fail because it's not properly formatted. It's just taking a line of JSON, a line of JSON, and then kind of smooshing it together, right? This is me using my FileMaker skills to get what I want. Um, but it's not the official way to, to write JSON. So when I look at the list of, because I'm looking at five records, I'm going to get five rows of JSON, right? So then I use the while function to basically dump the data into the right categories. So if you remember that report, it basically puts the bill type into one spot. So it's just different buckets, right? So in my while statement, which is a little crazy, but still really exciting, in my while function, I'm basically saying, go grab the bill type, where does it belong? Go put it in the billable category. Okay, what about the hours, four to six? Go put it in that category. And it just increments the number by one because I'm doing a count in this case. Um, I could increment it by a dollar amount if I wanted to or whatever other data I want. And so the script, show you with the debugger here. The first thing it does is grab that, that fake JSON, right? All those five rows with some JSON individually. I grab the headers so that I know what data I'm looking for. Uh, so another custom, another uh, JSON function to tell me what, what are my choices, right? What are my keys that I'm going to have? And so my keys are bill type, hours, job, and staff. Those are the categories I'm going to use. And then I can parse that data out and those two do the same thing. I was just playing around with some uh, global variable stuff. So my while statement is dropping this into buckets. Now, remember I said that JSON is really programmatic and structured really well. And so I can say, because this goes in the billable category, go grab the billable category and add one to it. So if I were to have a sixth row that was billable, when it gets to analyze the bill type and says, oh, it belongs in the billable pile, it's going to find this value, grab that and say, add one to it and then set the JSON back to it. So basically I'm just re, I keep resetting this every time that I, that, that the while statement loops through it. And then uh, I ended up, it, it's not the most beautiful thing in the end here, but I did end up creating HTML tables just to make it look a little bit more list friendly. Um, I kind of liked the idea that it was scrollable because again, they, they don't need to touch this data, they just need to see it. So by using a web viewer that just shows that HTML, I can I can see my information. So it's just a little tricky way there to, to get scrolling to be easy. So again, if I show all the records and it's a little bit longer, it doesn't take much to just be able to scroll, scroll through that and get your data. <clears throat> what do you guys think about this? Can you imagine doing something like this? Yeah. And I'm a little nervous to show you the while statement because when I had this idea that I was going to implement this, I, I thought it was a little bit easier than it was. But we got there and it works. It just took a little bit of practice. Um, but it got a little bit dramatic. Uh, and that's because I have to look at some JSON, pull some information from that JSON. I'm looking at multiple attributes, right? Multiple keys. And then I'm creating a new JSON. So there's, there's a little bit of complexity here for sure. It's definitely uh, on the advanced side. I think the while uh, function is really exciting and I think it's nice that you can put everything into a single line of code at the same time that is uh, a benefit and a detriment because it's really hard to troubleshoot this. Um, when I wrote this, I think I had the, you know, I equals I plus one in the wrong place and so I was incrementing at the wrong time and so it takes a little bit of practice and, and, and definitely some, some know-how to, to, to navigate around it. 
Um, but I, again, I do think it's a, a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool addition to the reporting techniques pile. I'll give you the warning that uh, I broke it pretty efficiently. Well, my client broke it, right? Because their clients always break our stuff, right? Um, my client broke it because it, they hit my recursion limit. Uh, and so I had to, obviously it was my fault, so I had to go in and fix it. Um, and luckily with the set recursion function, you can actually make the recursion as big as you want. So, or pretty big anyway. So I can go in there and say it can be a million times or five million times or whatever I want. But I totally hit the, yeah, the tens of thousands of limits. I would just uh, warn you about that. Oh, that's very zoomed in. All right. All right, so that's the little report there. So the while function is really fast, and I really like that about it, right? I'm all about speed, and obviously, clients don't want clients or Coworkers don't want to wait a long time for a report, so I like the speed behind it. Um, and I, I can't help but think of it as a, as a way to just put things in the right buckets because it's a, a while and I can build some logic into it. I can put things in the right place. It is hard to troubleshoot. It is hard to error trap. So uh, you might have to do some cleanup on the scripting side in advance to make sure your data is going to be solid before you try to do this. So at the end of the day, all these things are cool. There's, I love all of them. You know, some summary reports. You know, mostly because it makes these two guys over here drink their sodas. Um, mm. But they're basic. But sometimes that's all I need. <laughs> sometimes that's all you need, right? You know, I don't. Sometimes I get a little, a little excited about these new features and want to do that with everything. Uh, but a sub summary report can be just fine as is. Um, Execute SQL was a really good addition. I always see Execute SQL and JSON as parallel, right? They're different ways of collecting data. Uh, and the while function can be an addition to that. And then virtual list is a really good way of creating one, potentially one table that can create all the kinds of reports that you want. You don't necessarily need to have multiple tables to do those. You might, you might have two different virtual list tables if, if they're you know, vastly different, but you can reuse that table quite a bit. And at the bottom, I put that perform script on server makes a big difference too. So a lot of this stuff, a lot of these scripts, you can send it to the server make it do the hard work, and then bring back the data that you care about, right? And as long as you're on, say, FileMaker Server 18, you can use the while function on that side, right? So there's processing power that has to happen there. Uh, even though it's an efficient thing, if you're looking at tens of thousands of records, it's going to take a bit of time. So make the server, which should be more efficient, let it do the work. Um, and so I would highly recommend using Perform Script on Server as much as possible when, uh, when, when you have a, a hosted solution. And just a reminder that it really is strength in numbers. Each of one of these te techniques benefits most from being combined with other techniques. So there's complexity there, and it takes, again, some learning and some practice to be able to, to become proficient and efficient in it. Um, but it, again, it can be really worth it and can give your, your clients the experience, the reporting experience that they want. And that's it. Uh, Questions, thoughts? Those sample files you have. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yep, I'll I'll send them to you and we can post them. The community is that where yeah, you'll post them? Yeah, if they had questions or wants to Perfect. carry on this session further, they can do that. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I'll follow that one and then I will add the files for sure. Yep. Other questions, thoughts? Anything that you kind of vision in terms of things to watch out for when using this? Like, for example, Having a hundred records or whatever mm -hmm. everybody views, what happens when you max up that and create more additional records? Oh, good question. Yeah. So yeah, so you you bring up the point about virtual lists, and so because virtual lists are dependent on your on actual records in FileMaker, you do actually have records that are just in concept empty for the most part. Um, yeah, there's some error trapping that should happen on things like this. So you'll notice in my virtual list, I have a thousand rows. Well, what happens if I have my report ends up being a thousand and five rows? That's when your client calls you and says, you know, the data, you know, the report is broken. That's all you'll hear, and then you'll eventually realize you just don't, you're not showing all of your data. So it's there, it just it doesn't have a visual way of showing it. Um, you with paging or anything like that, or you just like show the top. And that's a good point. Yeah, I have you know I don't think I've done that, uh, but that's a good idea. Just paginate it, right? So here's one to fifty, and then go to the next one to fifty. 
Um, that would be one approach for sure. Um, the, mo the way I usually do it is I do a value count of my, my final product. So if there's 1,005, it would give me a value count of 1,005. And then I would say, hey, do I have enough records? And if I don't, loop through and create those records, um, which I can push to the server to do, which is really nice, right? So if I need to create, say, another 1,000 records, I'd rather the server do that than my local computer. Um, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, that's definitely a caveat that, uh, that I run into a little bit too often. So um, when you're doing execute SQL, you've got me thinking about some pain points here. Um, careful with the data viewer and execute sql uh you're very likely to have to force quit anyone have to force quit <laughs> it's uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah if you create some funky execute sql that's either a, a lot of processing power because it's joins in a big complex where or if you're just trying to pull in pull a lot of data uh it's very likely to freeze your machine so um i would say be patient uh Say that again. Yeah, you right. Run yep. So if you have, uh, if say you're hosted and someone's in a record, uh, in order for file for execute SQL to run, it has to pull down the whole table. Which, if you don't have skinny tables, it's going to crash FileMaker. Um, in some cases, it won't crash FileMaker, but again, it's still pulling a lot of data, and it's going to just it can kind of burn the engine there. So. so what happens if you have a runaway thing going on the server? Just slows down the server from my experience. Uh, it could time out. It doesn't have the same issue as it was. Usually not. No, I haven't seen it crash. I haven't seen like the server itself crash or have any issues. So yeah, I think it usually is just performance. What is it? Oh gosh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Let's all be very cautious and not have memory leaks. <laughs> have you have you had that happen before? Okay. Yeah, but a lot of times, yeah, that happens. Yeah, no big deal. That's good to know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm often victim of, you know, I use the data viewer to test on execute SQL, and I'm on a, you know, five records or something that I've done some nifty thing, and I close the data viewer, and then I do something else, and then I open the data viewer, and now I crash it because I'm looking at ten, you know, hundred thousand records, and it gets mad about it. So. Um, so yeah, so just be careful about those those kinds of things. Um, what I tend to do, just for a, a little FYI here, is if I uh, if I've got something like execute SQL um, and I just don't want to run it all the time, what I'll do is I'll say like something like if one equals if one equals zero, and just put that around it, just in the just in the data viewer, and so that way it's not going to run, right? So that if I run off on my data viewer and close it and come back. I just have to come back over here and say if one equals one, and then it'll actually do what I want it to do. So that's my little trick to, which again, I forget to do sometimes, but when I don't forget, I feel very smart and proud of myself for not crashing my database. I, I started uncrashing that box. The uh, automatically yeah, evaluate? Now I don't do the automatic. Yeah, I, I yeah. waver between those two choices all the yeah. time. So I totally but get I that. Even no, it doesn't. This will still, this will still function. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yep. Um, and as you work through Execute SQL and JSON, you'll get really familiar with all the error messages that you get. So uh, that can always be, they'll haunt your dreams a little bit. Uh, but you know, you start getting better and better and getting more used to to what those errors mean. Um, the the JSON ones are one that makes me mad because it always says that, and it just I don't like that. <laughs> Stop yelling at me. <laughs> Like how does that work with multi-user? It works, it works perfectly because every user, it's local to every user. And so because it's using global variables and, and or global fields, oh. it's specific to your user, your session. So we, you, Maka, could be in your own report. I could be in the same, technically the same virtual list, and we could do our different finds or collect the data differently, and we it would never interfere. Um, the only thing that would interfere is like if I actually deleted a record or something, that would be a problem. But you could totally do your own finds. It's it, it's pretty awesome that way. It's probably one of my favorite features about it. I guess they, uh, they're complaining that they can't hear the question. So oh, sorry. The question. Question. OK. Questions. Sorry to all the remote people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it works. The, the speaker phone works better when it's on the room. Other questions? Well, 
you showed us a bunch of stuff that was presentation worthy. Is there stuff you're looking at that you're hoping to present on in the future as well? That you're that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so Lion's done a lot with Carafe. I don't. Has anyone played with Carafe? Carafe. So, so Lion came out with a product called Carafe, and it's open source, and it uh, it involves JavaScript, and it's heavily used on the reporting side, or at least collecting data and showing it in really cool ways. Um, that's one place where I don't have a lot of familiarity, uh, but the reason I bring it up is because it tends to be very JSON driven. And so the idea that I can collect my data in a JSON format and then put it into these cool Carafe um, bundles is really exciting. So that's one thing that's on my, uh, on, on one of the things I'd like to do. Um, I don't know. I haven't found my, my I, I think I've, I've shown you my most recent challenges in the way that I've solved them. But yeah, did you, did, did you, were you able to find it or? Uh, announcing Carafe with PowerPoint 3, JavaScript tools, Yeah, so Carafe, yep. Uh, I was going to say, I think the website is Carafe.fm. Where's Jeremy Brown? Yeah, Jeremy Brown is going to be talking about Carafe. on that kudos for sure um so so craft lets you basically have representations of things in a web viewer and so really it's trying web viewer and javascript and json all these things come together um and so you'll see some pretty cool things where you know we're looking at something like a heat map right if you have the information behind it um to me this is one of the places like like a, a data table is becoming a more popular use of a web viewer because whether it's cross tab or just being able to sort columns really easily, um, there's a lot of power behind it. And so it really is part of the reporting discussion because again, it's the way that you're representing your your data. And so, uh, so yeah, so so Carafe is on my mind is quite a bit uh, as to how we could potentially report things. Vince is going to laugh at me. I'm super interested in Tableau, so I'm also curious as to what what's out there. Uh, so yeah, so I'll be here for your presentation whenever you decide to do that next. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm forcing it down him right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think a lot of what's going to happen with things like Claris Connect is that we're going to start using a lot of external stuff to create reports and to, to manage our data and to manage all our information. So I think that's where I want to see where things go. Uh, but I don't have anything super secret at the moment. So, um, but I'll try to come up with something cool for the next time. Stand by. Got to people back to you. Oh yeah, it is pretty late on the East Coast. Thanks for sticking it out. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? On the virtual list there, it's extremely flexible. So it doesn't just need to be kind of having your data uh, like a lot of the different examples have been. I think kind of a unique case years ago where Classic thing was trying to uh, print a big report, and you know the page ranking was not right. They got big text fields, and it's yeah, you know, some pages and all kinds of line comments and all that. So basically, just it, it had all kinds of formatting of headers and subheaders and all kinds of stuff. But basically, took every line, basically paragraph, put it as a value in the virtual table, and then you get uh, now records yeah. for everything. Yeah, so the thought of using uh, a virtual list as like a formatting tool where you can put things, I mean, the, when you're right, when you ever you just have a big piece of text in FileMaker, it can cut off wrong or, you know, so it either gets cut off completely or the pages are wrong. So, so making it record-based is a really good approach to that. You, you made me think of uh, that it works really well for Excel exports too because you can format it however you want. So if you have a client that needs to have the second row has to be empty and then every, you know, after every data 
row, there has to be an empty row, or, or some of those kind of really unique cases where it has to be formatted a very specific way. Headers. Headers, yeah, if you want your headers the way you want them. If you export out of a virtual list, you can still treat it as separate columns and have it the way you want it. Um, but you get you you do have more control whether it's scripted or within the fields. So yeah, I, I think they're they're super cool. I, I I like to use them. The other one that uh, we use it for, I don't have an example, is as a picker. So if you can think of having a process where you're trying, like if you're trying to pick a product and you're picking uh, first the, the product type, so you pick iPad and then you see all the different iPad sizes and then you see the iPad colors. If you have a products table, you can use something like Execute SQL to say, give me a distinct list of all the products. And so when I click on iPad, the next step is, to, and again, in a virtual list, right? I just grab and show maybe the, the name, there's an ID hidden in the back. Uh, and then when I choose iPad, it goes, okay, and now for the Execute SQL, let me add in my where's to clause, it's where the category equals iPad. And then I can say, grab the size, right? And so then it'll show me all the, the, the screen sizes. And then when I click on that, now it's where it's iPad and the screen size. Um, and you can kind of keep going down that path. And you can do that all in one table, right? You don't have to switch because I don't really care about the real data yet. I'm trying to collect data and manipulate it. And so it's, I'm using it as a visual tool, not as a, an actual data tool. Um, so that's another way that I've used it. And, and I like it because again, I, I, my script can be very circular, right? Just, yeah, yes, the less tables and table occurrences and all that good stuff, the better. So yeah, totally agree. All right, well, I appreciate everyone's time. Thanks for coming. Um, we'll upload the files and uh, I'm happy to chat if you guys have any questions. So thanks. Thank So we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to, and then uh, Jared's going to pre pre present on the FM admin console, which is on the app store, right? Cool. <clears throat> How's that? Is that working? Yeah. Okay. Did you want to move here or you want to stay there? I stay here. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I just connect to this, eh? Yeah. Uh, okay. Are you gonna tell us about your competitors too? Uh, Are there any? On the store? Yeah, yeah I think so. Oh, the same, same kind of... Yeah, I don't, I don't know how much, how maintained. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's actually already. Um, it's by yours. Is it? Is it? Well, I thought it was a question. 
And, uh, if you had to choose to make this extended, uh, how do I? And only 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, that's too fast. Too fast. Uh, you just show the website. Here's the link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Download it now. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a little more comprehensive. <laughs> Oh, okay. What's that? Uh, it's up there. Oh, but it's, we don't see it on. Uh, you gotta share screen. Share screen no. in the web app. The web. Oh, okay. Go to meeting. Uh, okay. Where's the share screen thing? Oh, might be. Yeah, hey, where is the share screen? It's down the bottom of the last icon, I think. Oh, that one right here? Got it? No, I don't have it. Is that working? Uh, no, I guess no. that's not, maybe not that one. Do you know? Did you make him presenter? Yeah. Eight for that. So the audio presenter. Share my screen. It's under web. No, that's in, that's that's my webcam. Let's see. Uh, Steve, how does how does he show his screen? Hmm? How does he show his screen? So does he have a little control panel thingy? Yeah. yeah. Um. Interesting, you don't have it. Oh, it looks like it's not right screen. Did you wait for presenter? I thought I did. Oh, you know what? I had to quit and relaunch oh. because of uh, Catalina's wonderful security. Uh, oh, there's there's another Jared now. Yeah, I had to I had to log off and back on. Okay. So it didn't. We're gonna make presenter. There we go. Okay. Presenter. Okay. All right. Here go pro. There you go. All the way up to go pro. <coughs> Yep. Uh, that's it. Sounds perfect for me right now. I have what? All right, that working? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, I think that's You should actually show the clip from the iTunes YouTube thing with the guy with the headphones grooving with the thousand songs in his pocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I you see. You get to play on that. That's, yeah. that's the yeah. play on that. Yeah. You know? so my, my favorite part was like he's listening to the music and then. It's a headphones on, and then they just up the bass. It's like, whoa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> yeah. Get a, get a license to some song. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll have to see if the Sheik song will work. Like that. Freak song will work. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm about ready to go. No, you do it. Okay, so you can probably even turn your mic on, I think. Oh, I need a 
I, I'm using my speaker. So that's okay, I got it. This is working. Yeah. So uh, we're going to get started here. Our uh, our next speaker is uh, Jared Cake from Canada. Canadian. Canadian, yes. Yep. Another Canadian. So uh, Jared's going to talk to us about his iOS app to um, um, to uh, monitor servers. Yeah. I'll, I'll now, why are you introducing him? What, what's your connection to it? Because I'm from Montreal. I'm from, I'm also oh, from Canada. And, and beeswax as well. And and he's, yeah. he's There's also a part of our team. Yeah. Uh, so he's joined okay. our team about a year ago. So welcome, Jared. All right. Okay, so I'll, uh, I have some slides to introduce myself, so I'll repeat a little bit, but uh, yeah, my name's Jared Haig. Um, I'm a, a proud Canadian, Yay. and uh, I live in Alberta, um, and uh, just in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains, and it's a great place in the summertime. Uh, it's it's great for like going out and looking for Christmas tree. Um, I, I really enjoy it, except for uh, this was September 30th. Oh, that's when you start your programming, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, that's the great thing about working, having home office, is uh, everyone's got to dig themselves out, and I can still have a productive day. <laughs> so, uh, my hobbies are uh, really just my kids because they take up most of my time now uh, when I'm not uh, a writing file maker. Um, I've been uh, doing file maker, uh, working with FileMaker for 15 years and I, I started working with Beeswax just over a year ago and um, the other thing related is uh, my FM Invent console app on the App Store. Um, so back when uh, the iPad came out and FileMaker Go came out, uh, I, I just recently started doing full-time consulting. I pretty much just decided I like doing this FileMaker stuff, but I just want to do it for on my own. And uh, I uh, went and thought FileMaker Go is a great excuse to buy an iPad. So I bought an iPad and uh, Went out. I had no clients really, but I just walked around door to door in the city and uh, said, "Hey, I can write software for this. Uh, are you interested?" You know, that's pretty much it. And I got some clients that way to begin, and uh, it's been busy ever since. And the uh, most of the stuff that I've done has been uh, in FileMaker Go. Um, you know, I saw it as a it's a great opportunity, and uh, it's it's my favorite thing to develop in is in FileMaker Go. Now, uh, when I decided to make this app, uh, I saw the admin API and I thought, I, you know, I saw the possibility of this and I thought, well, I want to have, um, I want to be able to see uh, a bunch of servers quickly for my, you know, my different clients. I want to see their servers and what's going on. I, I don't want to have to like go in a browser and log in. Um, I, I wanted it to be a mobile solution so I could be walking around and uh, doing something and uh, be able to just take a quick look at servers. And I also kind of wanted to be able to have uh, individual passwords saved per um, per server instead of like one thing for going into the application itself. And uh, and I wanted so much more too that I'm, you know, have lots more things planned for this uh, this thing. And, and uh, there's there's a lot of um, possibilities. Um, now, one thing, one thing I had like a lot of people using like uh, the XML thing and it's kind of like tired of switching that on. So I was like, restore some functions that uh, the Min API still had access to. It was nice. And uh, uh, Min API, I mean, it's really awesome that it can give us, not just for this application, but, you know, you can run it in your um, 
uh, applications and uh, uh, you can access the server and, and do things like this morning a great example was uh, told to me about um, when uh, you're doing a server-side script and it's a really heavy task and it's sitting there performing on script for a long period of time uh, you could run an admin api call to see if it's complete or not before you start doing another one so you know there's lots of uh lots of really great capabilities and uh so now i love uh filemaker <laughs> uh filemaker go so much and i've done so much development in it so why did i write my app in swift you may wonder and uh um it, it just sometimes I just believe that FileMaker Go might not be the right right uh, tool for the job, and uh, so I'll switch over to my demo now. Uh, let's see this. Okay, so all right, here's. Here's my iPad. Okay. So we'll open up the application here. And you can see I've got uh, three servers listed here. If you want to add a new server, you hit the plus button up in the top right. Then it brings up the dialog to start entering a server name. You can put in the credentials and save it on this use touch ID or base ID. Um, once you save, let's put some stuff in here. Just got to make sure it's, uh, you know, it's got some basic validation. And we hit save and it adds that server. So if you want to edit the server, you could bring it over, hit edit, make your changes. If you want to delete, you can swipe over and delete or just swipe all the way across to get oops, get rid of it um so uh, i'll connect to a server now there's two different things like one says connect one says sign in the ones that says connect uh the credentials have been saved in keychain and uh, so if i tap on that it'll just ask me to touch id or at least face id whichever you have and uh, so I'll hit the top one And it shows me that uh, right now I have no connections. Uh, I've got three out of 20 databases running. So I'm going to connect to this database, to one of my databases for my phone. And I'll just pull this to refresh, and you'll see that uh, I've got one connection. And I will uh, bring up FileMaker Go here. And uh, so this is a this is a FileMaker Go solution that I made. I mean, I really there's a lot of awesome things about FileMaker Go. Um, so we've got FileMaker on the on the right. We got the main console on the left. Um, and uh, if I refresh, it'll show the two connections now. If I go into databases. You can see my list of databases there. You get a little eye, you can get a little more info about uh, about your databases um, information. And um, uh, if I go to this one, it'll show the two connections. And if you tap on it, it'll you know it shows you uh, all of the people that are connected. So if I wanted to um, send a message to myself in FileMaker. I can do that and say, hey, it's going to send the message and then FileMaker uh, gets that message. Um, if I want to uh, get more details about that, I can go in here. Um, if I wanted to, I could uh, either send message button, I could disconnect, uh, do that and be mean. No very then. So, hey, look at that. That's not cool. So, so 
So now, uh, the one thing that's uh, uh, one of the reasons I chose to to use this um, chose to write this in Swift is um, it's got some nifty capabilities uh, with things like forms and stuff where um, you can make selections and it can dynamically change uh, what you're uh, using. So if I go and I say I want to make like a a script schedule, I can uh, oops, choose the name, type in something, I can choose one of the databases. Um, uh, currently, you, you have to type in the script because the admin API, it doesn't fetch the script names from the database for you, but that is definitely coming because it is supported in the admin, in, in the data API. Um, uh, if you wanted, this is kind of neat, like if you pick weekly, go in, mark your days you want to run your schedule, enable it, hit save, and it shows up at the bottom there. And if I wanted to disable, I can go like that, hit the button, or if I want to delete it, there it goes. So, um, yeah, if you want to, if you want to like check out one of the schedules that you've made, you can tap on it and see all the details from it. And it uh, um, kind of gives you a, uh, let's see, you know, it says runs every day, uh, runs every Monday and Thursday, or you know, it kind of puts it into plain English so it's easy to understand. Um, and from here, you have like all of the capabilities to run it, at duplicate, disable. If you wanted, let's say I wanted to duplicate this one, then there's a copy version of it now. And so I could go in here and I could edit it. Maybe this one, I want to have it uh, run on a different day. Let's put those two in, hit save, come back here. There it is. So, um, of course, if we go to uh, the settings, uh, you have all your uh, setting, the general settings available for your server. So if you wanted to change something like <coughs> the cache size or the, the amount of files that your server hosts, you can just tap that. Uh, you want to, uh, all this stuff is, you know, basic toggles and stuff that you, you could imagine. Turn on the uh, ODBC, turn on a data API. Um, the other thing, one thing too, if you go to uh, web publishing engine, it shows every um, every web publishing machine that you have available uh, in a list. And um, so uh, my main goal with this first release was to I wanted to support every offering that the uh, admin API had. So I just made sure I kind of su supported all those different functions. Uh, if you if you add like a, a, a cloud server to this, it automatically knows to, uh, you know, it, those menus would just won't show up for the things that uh, aren't applicable to cloud. And, um, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Uh, questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, report on multiple machine installations as well. Like you have a your, your web publishing engine on a separate server. Sure. Did yep. Communicate that as well. Yeah. If you go in here, like if this was just one machine, so if there was like a two or three web publishing engines, they all show up there. Yeah. And they work on iPhone. Certainly does. So. Um, you can imagine, uh, I'll uh, bring this up and show you. I mean, really, well, does anything, hold it sideways. Or, oh no, because this is always split, but yeah, if you uh, if you open it on, a, on the iPhone, it's just a condensed view of the same thing. And uh, yeah, it slides over. So you wrote it in Swift, does that mean it works on the Mac too or? Yeah. It could, it could work on the Mac right now. I've uh, I compiled it and ran it on the Mac, but 
um, it is, uh, I'm using a library in here that it's, doesn't give very good user experience when uh, compiled using, uh, um, uh, what's it called, Catalyst, right? Like it's just, uh, uh, so what I'm what I'm currently working on right now is removing that library so that the application will support dark mode automatically, and um, it'll also uh, allow me it'll it'll be free of any third party thing. So anything gets updated, there's like no problem, uh, just immediately supporting things. And uh, uh, I'm right the like these screens here, all all the ones that are forms uh, use a library a Swift library. And uh, I'm I'm rewriting those all in Swift UI, and uh, because it's a little better uh, experience than either library gives. So um, I'm just, I really I really was trying to get the update out before before I came down, but I was just too busy. So if you have access to your laptop and to the web console, mm -hmm. and you have your app, which one which one do you prefer to use? Oh, I, I always just use my app. Unless the you thing always, is, you go use that whenever you can. Oh yeah, if I'm working too, like I mean, if I'm working, I, I don't want to open the thing up. I'll just like go to my app and you know open up a thing. It's just one tap to get in, right? And and the thing is, there's there's a lot of like potential here as far as like, hey, hey Siri, how many users are on the uh, system right now? Like that's uh, that's something that's not going to be difficult to add. So because uh, I I just got to put in some Siri intents and uh, that kind of stuff will be available. So there, there's I don't want to say like oh I'm going to add this and this and this because I mean it's going to vaporware <laughs> right until it's actually done. But uh, you know the, you start charging more for it then or you not have to no how much is it? Uh, it's uh well, let's see I got a web page yeah it's. Thirteen. Yeah, no, the price is uh, yeah, thirteen dollars, thirteen ninety nine. So I, I priced it in Canadian, and that's the exchange. Yeah, that's U.S. So in uh, in Canada, it's twenty bucks. So you can see. Uh, yeah, you get a nice American discount. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, interesting, hey, but um, yeah, I, I got a lot of plans. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of dependent upon the amount of support I get. Will definitely depend. <laughs> Lots of support, new features will roll out quicker because I'll be able to justify spending more time on it. But I spent quite a bit of time on it, and it was like so that's free upgrade. Again? It's a pre yeah, it is free upgrades. Yeah, oh, you yeah. you get it, you get it for a long time. I, I do have. Uh, I'll just say that if I can take this like all the way where I want it to go, you'll there's not like I, I don't think there'll be like a pro version, but there may be a service involved at some point. But the thing is, you'll get all the functionality that it currently has. And you'll never have to pay. Like it'll always be upgraded with at least this, and um, and any other uh, stuff that um, anything that the admin API puts in, I plan to add to this. If there's any kind of growth in that at all. I'll add those features. If you have the app, it's going to be a free update. But you already have people at Mark going? No, Simon. Uh, oh, uh, Brian, uh, he's one of our developers. And he's a uh, he's a mobile app. Uh, well, he's actually more than mobile. He does uh, Swift server development, uh, and he was uh, contributing author to some. Yeah. I mean, he's using it now. I, I think Simon looked at it, or one of our IT people looked at it. I'm not sure if they're currently using it or not. I'm not sure. Someone asked me how much Swift I'd I'd, I'd uh, written before I started writing yeah, this app. Same question. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good one. The answer was zero. Ooh. Yeah. What was zero? No Swift. Swift knowledge, or did you have? Yeah, like I, I had. Um, I'm 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 like a really big time nerd. So like I'll sit and I'll read I don't I don't read uh, I don't read uh, 
I won't read a novel, but I'll sit down with like a, the Swift standard library and I'll read that. I don't know if that's just like the kind of thing that's interesting for me. So, um, but uh, when I when I started doing this, I did have experience with uh, Objective C. So I I done a little bit of stuff in Objective C. I, I was paying attention when Swift came out. You know, I played around with it, but I never like did anything for production. And uh, so this was the first thing where, where I was like, uh, you know, I mean, it's no one's like gonna come over to me and say, hey, go write an application in Swift, you know, cause like I'm a FileMaker developer, no one's gonna say that to me. So I was just like, yeah, I, you know, I'll just write this app in Swift and, you know, see if it turns heads, I mean, whatever. So I just decided to do that. And, so it was, it was obvious to me what you know what you were doing in there that's in Swift that you couldn't have done in Filemaker Go. But yeah. did you want to communicate any of anything that you that well, outstanding to you why you wouldn't want to do that in Swift Go? Well this is this is the funny thing, is like and even when I pre prepared this, I'm like, I don't like yeah, there's some stuff in here that I wanted to do that I couldn't do in Go, but I don't want to slam Go because the thing is like Go is really good. Like a lot of times, I got loads of clients that use Go, and a lot of times Go is exactly what you need. Occasionally, it's not. So, you know, that's the thing is, uh, I'm I'm always a person like FileMaker is a great solution. Sometimes, like I'll be working on something and I'll say, you know, FileMaker maybe not the right thing. Like even uh, doing mobile development. I've got clients that uh, make a FileMaker solution for, it, and then they're like, let's do mobile stuff. And I'm like, okay, let's FileMaker go. And then they start explaining to me what they want. And then I'm like, well, uh, you know what? I'm gonna make like a, I'm gonna write it all in JavaScript and, and make you a mobile app in JavaScript. And because their requirement doesn't fit exactly. So you know, I, I'll just kind of go with whatever I think it's the right tool and and uh, and whatever fits the job. It has access to the logs too. It doesn't have access to the logs, but uh, because basically, if you want to know capability of this, all you got to do is look at the min API. Okay. All that stuff, anything there will be, it, it'll do. But beyond beyond that, I've, I have some plans for that might be surprising, but. Uh, well, yeah, that's definitely <laughs> thing. Well, the thing is, I would love to, for this, especially when I release one on desktop after, um, after I get uh, the uh, stuff done in Swift UI, then I can release desktop version, mm -hmm. and then that's when things kind of where I'm going to start focusing on new stuff, uh, extending capabilities, and and uh, I, I think there's I got a lot of like uh, interesting things I'd love to share. <laughs> Wow. But yeah, it's like I'll I'll keep those to myself for now. But uh, um, it, it, it's it's not a leak because uh, it's not like I'm trying to keep secret plans. But like I don't want to promise anything uh, before it gets delivered, right? So, um, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot of potential. In it. Yeah. yeah, many many times I've been out in the middle somewhere without my laptop and say, oh, if I could just. Oh yeah, I, I've got clients like uh, all, all the way from like, uh, I've got clients I work with in Newfoundland and in Vancouver. Like, so it goes right, right across the country. So I'll get like call at like, uh, you know, four o'clock in the morning uh, from out east and they'll be like, oh, what's up? You know, and I'll be like, oh, let's check the server down or something. And I'll just open my phone up and, and check quickly and see, you know, check connections and stuff. But, yeah, it's been it's been a fun project. Well, thanks for making yeah. it. Like, yeah, price to try. Even. <laughs> so. Yeah, I wanted to like. I, I thought about maybe doing it for free, but I don't know. I I work hard on this. I need to charge yeah. at least something. Right. But yeah. Uh huh. Well, I don't know. It's fair to ask how many you sold. Um. Oh, I'll keep that to myself. For now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say it's like. Uh, Really surprising because uh, it's definitely worldwide, and I haven't localized yet. So yeah, I've had like I've had sales in uh, uh, lots of different countries. Yeah.
uh, my first sales were in Japan. Wow, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I got a, I got localized. That's another thing too. Very cool. Except for Sweden. Except they don't. No, no Sweden, Swedish server anymore. Though. Yeah, I think oh, for FileMaker, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I can lo I can localize. One of the things I actually removed from this, which I originally had, was uh, um, time zone support. So your servers, like when it shows like when someone logged in, like if it's FileMaker Cloud, it's all uh, uh, UTC, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, someone logs into the server, and I look at, oh, like uh, Bob just logged on it. What time? What? Uh, let's see, minus seven, uh, 10, you know what I mean? And so uh, I originally had uh, support where it just, you know, the phone can just know what time zone it is, right? right. And so it just automatically does the conversion. But um, I had a few problems with it. One of, one of the things is uh, when you do like a schedule, um, if you set a schedule up to run, uh, and you have it, um, oh, what's the scenario? You have a schedule run to like do a repeat or something like that. What happens is you gotta, um, basically you can't have it repeat overnight, like over the midnight, like the schedule um, repetitions kind of have to go within a day. And so the thing is if I shift the time zone over beyond and so the thing is what the end of a day for you is different and so if you have if you say i want to start the schedule at six and i want to run it till two in the afternoon well if it goes over utc midnight it's not gonna work so i was like i was like thinking i was all smart like oh, time zone support this is great and then i <laughs> then i ran into that problem and i was just like that time zone support's gone now shoot so <laughs> That was a bummer because I thought that would have really been a nice thing to have. But cool. Well, thank you, Jared. That is really cool. Um, Thanks. We don't have any other uh, questions online other than uh, nicely done from Dave. Uh, and uh, Dave's, uh, Dave, Dave's question was about how much Swift support, that, uh, how much Swift have you written before? Yeah. So, cool. They're all, they're all on. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so uh, January is coming up. Uh, we don't have any speakers for next year yet. Uh, there's anybody in this room who is interested. Oh, and also, uh, if you wanted to petition for a different time, you have to ask that guy right there. <laughs> you don't have to ask me. Yeah. I didn't think I had any say. Uh, but he's already got well, you're leader, the leader later. You're the host. Yeah, design. exactly. <laughs> you're the one who's, uh, oh, I did thank him later. On behalf of other people, <laughs> I kind of like. I, honestly, I kind of like that it goes past the really rush hour part. So, like, we're here during that, so that we're not leaving at five. Personally, I really appreciate I'm, I'm that. this time. Yeah, this, this time is great. Yeah. So I figured Eric was going to keep this in my arm until it was like two in the morning. <laughs> well, you live, I mean, you're like, you live, when I would get more than one email about it, then I would, I would, I would say something. Mm -hmm. We kept shifting about half an hour every every month for a while. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, um, anything else? Uh, 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 sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's it. Okay, we got we got to find speakers. Uh, we also want to thank Martha very much for thank, I mean, taking the time to come and.